Right. All right, everybody. That was the bell, right? Yeah. I have this habit of talking through the bell, and I'm never quite sure if it happened or not. Um, all right, so a couple questions about the Excel lab. Somebody asked about, about um, how do we know if it's an outlier or not? And that's, there's a couple different ways you can, you can determine that. And it, it depends a little bit about what field you're in and what your data set looks like, which version you use. What we'll use most in this class is um, if it's more than two standard deviations away from the average, it's an outlier. So if you've calculated your average already and you calculated your standard deviation already, so typically if it's a normally distributed data set, it should look like a bell curve, right? That's what's called the normal distribution. And so the, the middle of the normal distribution is gonna be your average. And so half of your data points should be above that, half of your data points should be below that. Um, and whatever your, your standard deviation is, is what I have labeled here is the Greek letter sigma. Sigma. It was a Greek letter before it was a slur. Is it a slur? I don't know. Insult, maybe a better term. It's a compliment to be sigma? Okay. Thanks for keeping me current on things. Okay. All right. I thought it was like worse than beta. No, no. Sigma is better. Okay. So in this case, in standard deviation terms, bring it back. Um, sigma is standard deviation if you have the whole data set. So in this case, if you're more than two standard deviations away from the average, it's an outlier. So basically, if you know what the average is because you calculated it in Excel, and you know what the standard deviation is because you calculated it in Excel, anything you take your, your average plus two times your standard deviation, and that'll give you like a limit. That'll give you a cutoff. For your, and anything that's bigger than that number, you're going to get rid of and call it an out, label it as an outlier. And then you're going to take your average minus two standard deviations. That's a minus, not a uh, underscore. I just was looking the other way while I was talking while I was writing. Um, your average minus two standard deviations is going to give you the lower end. And anything that's smaller than that gets thrown out as an outlier. Right? So there, like I said, there are other ways you can label that or other ways you can determine whether something is an outlier. Um, in uh, in education, a lot of times, or in, in economics, they use what's called interquartile range, which is similar to this, except you don't have to count uh, calculate standard deviation, so that's a little bit easier sometimes. Um, but since we have spreadsheets and we know how to calculate standard deviations, this is pretty straightforward as long as you've got your laptop with you, right? Yeah. Second question about the Excel lab. How do you solve for where these two equations run into each other? How do you determine when these the two equations for these two lines are going to intersect? Set them equal to each other, right? We know that when these two lines are intersecting, they have to have the same y value. So you just take, so if they have to have the same y value, we can say 1.08x minus 0.059 equals negative <laughs> negative 3.28x plus 3.24. Now, I just grabbed these, these numbers from somebody's page um, sitting in front of me. It works the same for where, regardless of what the equation of your line is. You'll do the same process. And then it's just a matter of, OK, well, I could put all my x's on one side by adding 3.28x to this side. And then I'm going to add 0 0.059 to both sides. And so we'll get something that looks like 4. Point, what was that wind up? 4.36x yep. equals 3. Point, what does that wind up being? 3.30? Divide both sides by 4.36 and you're home. Yeah. Right, so 
remind yourself how the rules of algebra work if you're trying to solve for some of these some of these variables. Um, and a lot of times, this is what's called a system of equations. You saw another problem, a work problem that involved doing system of equations in your assignment from yesterday. Did anybody get to the uh, last problem on there? The copper and the lead? They had a question, um, not on the last problem, how many got to question six? Um, but on the first one with the uncertainty, yes. So um, when you're doing, so so the, like I think one of the measurements was you know it was an area measurement with thirty five point zero feet, and you're converting that to centimeters. Um, thirty five feet by what was it fifteen point zero feet? Off the top of my head. And you're converting that to uh, centimeters squared for the mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And then you're doing your uncertainty for that measurement once you converted it. The uncertainty right now is in the tenths place, right? It's plus or minus 0.1 of the foot. Until we multiply them. And then when we multiply them, where how does that affect the uncertainty? So once once we multiply them, we're, we're using multiplication and division rules when it comes to sig figs, right? Multiplication and division isn't about keeping the same uncertainty. Multiplication and division is about keeping the same number of sig figs. So once you multiply these together, get what, 300 and, uh, what, 525? Something like that? Uh, 525. 525? Yeah. And this, whatever, this might be so, and it should be, if that's the exact, then it's out to infinity with zeros. Exact, right? Except we only get to keep three sig figs. So now that means that our uncertainty is now plus or minus one square foot. I forgot to put units on it. It's not feet, now it's square feet. So our initial measurements were only off by 0.1 foot and 0.1 foot, but that means when we multiply them together, that compounds the uncertainty. So now our uncertainty, we could be off by an entire foot, square foot. And when you convert that to, let's say, centimeters squared instead of feet squared, mm -hmm. your uncertainty is still in the third sig fig, right? It'll still be three sig figs, even though... Um, if we're if we're converting like this, so 525 feet squared, one foot is 12 inches, right? So we have to do both sides of the square. So what do we do? Square it. We need to do this twice. We have to convert both powers of foot to inches. And then we can do inches to centimeters, right? But we have to do it twice. So that's an exact conversion because it's not about 12 inches in a foot, right? That should even seem silly to think about. Is it about 12 inches? No, it's exactly 12 inches in a foot. It's the definition of a foot, right? Right. Thank you. And then on this one, this one's also exact. This one's less obvious, but they actually redefined what an inch was back in the 80s. Um, before, the metric system and the imperial system were, were completely separate and there was no exact conversion. But then in the 80s, they realized, well, it was like 2.54002 and then continue on, continuing on. And they just actually changed what an inch was to say, it's exactly 2.54 centimeters. Um, so that we could have an exact conversion between metric and imperial units. So exact conversion, exact conversion, three sig figs, our answer is gonna have three sig figs. And it's gonna be something that we have to write in scientific notation, right? What do you get for the answer when you do this one? Four. Four? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 500 times 144 times 2.54 squared is 
is something like six, if I'm remembering properly. So six times 150, that's 900 times 500. We're sitting in the four point, you were close, four. 487,740. Uh, 0.96. That's close enough. Yeah, it started with four. You were right. You should just kept going. So we can't write all these sig figs, right? So we only keep three sig figs, and we can't just say 488,000 because what type of number is that? We use a, I use a specific term when we were talking about this on uh, Monday. We don't know how many sig figs it is, right? If I just write it like this, we know. We all just did this problem together. But say somebody else walked in the room and looked at this. They wouldn't know if that's six sig figs or three sig figs or it's something in between. So to specify, so that's what we call an ambiguous number. Ambiguous just means undefined. We don't want ambiguous numbers. We want numbers where it's very obvious how many sig figs there are. So we write it in scientific notation. So 4.88 times 10 to the five centimeters squared. Where is the uncertainty now? We know it's got three sig figs, but it's plus or minus what? <laughs> Any other guesses? Yes. Plus or minus a thousand, right? We we had a more exact number, but we didn't get to keep all the sig figs, so we get to keep where we rounded it. We could be off by one in this digit. So the uncertainty is plus or minus a thousand. <laughs> All right, any other questions about uncertainty and rounding for right now? Or anything else from yesterday's assignment? Yeah. Um, in, if I was writing in scientific notation, you can write it as plus or minus 0 0.01 times 10 to the five. But then we could simplify that, right? 0 0.01 times 10 to the 5 is the same thing as saying 1 times 10 to the 3, right? Centimeters squared, centimeters squared. If I have it written like this, if I'm trying to avoid using scientific notation, this is definitely a case where it's going to be more writing to not put it in scientific notation. But you can write plus or minus 1,000 square centimeters. As soon as we add this, it's no longer ambiguous, right? Because I explicitly said, there's where my uncertainty is. This also, normally we wouldn't even need to write this. If you write it in scientific notation, it's just assumed that your uncertainty is plus or minus one in the last digit. Um, if it's anything other than that, it's usually written out somewhere. Even something like, you know, like a Fitbit or the um, your um, Google Maps directions has uncertainty programmed into it by the engineers who developed the software. They could write a lot more digits on, you know, say the distance between here and Golden Gate Park, Park in San Francisco. They usually only report it to a tenth of a mile because pretty easy to be off by a tenth of a mile just by, well, just by having different uh, tire inflation, different diameter on your tires can make it show up differently on your odometer, right? So a lot of times um, when you look at any number on a digital screen, it's plus or minus one in that last digit. That's why they stop showing the digits there. It's not just that nobody cares about more digits. It's also that they don't know with any certainty past that digit. All right. 
Any other questions for now? We're feeling pretty good about rounding. Like maybe we should talk about something a little bit more interesting. Don't get me wrong, I can talk about uncertainty all day because uncertainty is really kind of interesting to me when you start looking at the way you measure uncertainty and when we get to quantum, there's a whole, there's a whole unit on, on uh, the uncertainty principle, which is interesting in and of itself. However, we don't need to spend all day on uncertainty. Today. All right. Um, We want to answer any of these right now. I talked about the problem of other people's minds. We don't need to talk about that again. I do like that question. Philosophy questions will get some attention from me. I do like philosophy questions. Um, we'll go with this. What's the longest? This one should get should help you when you get stuck on uh, problem six on the assignment from yesterday. The longest I've ever spent solving one chemistry problem. Depends if you count my research in grad school as a chemistry problem. Because if so, then about three and a half years. Um, and if you don't count that, if you just mean classwork, a uh, couple weeks of working at it a couple hours a day, um, turns out things get really, really complicated, especially when you get to grad level classes. And sometimes it takes that long. And um, a lot of times, or what my, my advisor in grad school is fond of saying is, if you're not dreaming about chemistry, then you're not working hard enough. Um, and so oftentimes when I was working on problems like that in grad school, it would be a case of wake up in the middle of the night with a certain clarification, or at least it felt like I understood something. And then I would write it down and go back to sleep and I'd wake up the next day and it made zero sense. Um, but that's a pretty normal event as well. Um, sometimes you wind up, they, you actually start, have to start keep not quite a dream journal, but you have to start keeping like a notepad by your bed when you're doing research and problems like that. Um, because sometimes your subconscious is still turning stuff over with, while you're sleeping and you'll wake up with some great idea. And if you don't write it down, all, when you wake up in the morning, you'll just remember that you had a great idea and have no idea what it was. Um, so you have to write those things down. Fun fact, uh, that's also how Keith Richards wrote the, uh, the guitar lick from Satisfaction. Um, he has zero recollection of doing it, but he kept a, an acoustic guitar and tape recorder by his bed when the Rolling Stones were starting out. Um, and he uh, he woke up in the middle of the night, hit record, played Satisfaction once, and he was so asleep that he didn't even hit stop on the rec on the recording. So it's like one one time through the riff of Satisfaction, and then three hours of Keith Richards snoring um, the, on the first documented recording of that song. So even Keith Richards, it's good enough for Keith Richards, it's good enough for you. Not a bad idea to keep a notebook by your bed. Let's see, let's go to, let's talk about energy a little bit. We talked, we looked at this equation to end class on Monday, right? This this equation is what we're going to spend all day tomorrow working. Right, so the, the whole gist of what you're going to be doing tomorrow is we're going to be trying to find the specific heat of, a, of an unknown metal. It won't necessarily actually be an unknown metal. Um, I believe it's something that you can... If I'm remembering correctly, it's something that you can look at and you probably can recognize what, what metal it is just by the way it looks. But the whole idea is that we can measure how much energy goes into a system if we know the mass of that system, the specific heat of that system, and how much the temperature changed. All right, so, but before we do that, let's... Let's do a practice problem. All right, so this is a process called calorimetry. Calorimetry literally means measuring heat. Calorimetry is basically you cause some energy to change hands and you measure how much the temperature changes. And then you use this equation, the Q equals MCP delta T equation to figure out what that energy number is. So, Here's an example. If you burn one gram of table sugar, 
and it produces 16.5 kilojoules of energy. What is a kilojoule? A thousand joules, good. What's a joule? Energy, because I just told you it was energy. Um, we don't really have any context for these. So I guess we will start by going through this slide. Um, the units for energy wind up making a difference. We can't really do anything with these calculations unless we know what kind of units we're dealing with. So the, one of the first units of energy that was actually defined is called the calorie. So it's similar to the calorie that we use for nutrition. Um, the, a calorie is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That's the definition of it. If you have water and it changes temperature by one, one gram of water changes temperature by one degree Celsius, it must have absorbed one calorie. That's not doesn't sound like very much energy though, right? One, what's one gram of water? What does that look like? About a milliliter, a tiny, pretty tiny amount, right? Calories, nutritional calories are actually kilocalories. Um, but we don't call them kilocalories in the US because as Americans, we have a phobia of metric prefixes. Um, so they don't call them calories. If you notice though, Usually nutritional facts will have calories capitalized. A capital C calorie is a kilocalorie, which the rest of the world more sensibly labels as a kcal. And that's the same as a thousand lowercase calories. Why would we do that? All just to avoid using that prefix there. Um, seems excessive. Seems like we're, it's more like, you know, just taking a stand on principle, not really for any good reason other than, well, no, I don't want to, um, which also tracks with, uh, we won't get into politics. Um, the joule is more, is what we use is what's called the SI or the, the metric energy unit. And that's actually comes from the original definition of kinetic energy. It said kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. If you plug in all the standard units in physics for all these, so if you plug in kilograms and you plug in meters per second, the units over here wind up being kilograms times meters squared over seconds squared which is not very easy to write, not doesn't roll off the tongue very well. So they just redefined that. A kilogram one, kilogram meters squared per second squared is one joule. Those units don't really make any sense on their own together unless you know that they wind up being an energy unit and they just redefined that energy unit to be a joule. So we're gonna, for the most part, we're gonna stick with joules in this class, but calories are also pretty widely used. So we need to have, know the conversion back and forth between them. Luckily, that's a pretty easy one. It's one step conversion. One calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. I believe that's a measured number, but it's four sig figs is more than you'll ever need for this equation. So that's good enough. Maybe they redefined that one too. That might be exact. Again, doesn't really matter because you're never going to have four sig figs when you're using that conversion. Um, those are far from the only energy units though. I like these because you can actually wind up with some really interesting things. If you look at different areas that, you, that deal with energy calculations, they measure energy very differently. Um, if you go into mechanical engineering, you see BTUs a lot. Does anybody know what BTU stands for or where you see it? What's that? Mechanical, well, I, it says mechanical engineering, but I meant more specifically. Uh, I guess none of you have probably ever bought a furnace or a water heater yourself, right? You may have helped your parents put one in, but you probably didn't buy it yourself. 
Um, BTUs is how most furnaces and hot water heaters are rated. Um, so more BTUs means it can heat things up faster. And BTU stands for British Thermal Unit. It's basically just an arbitrary amount of energy that they use to rate furnaces. Um, physics and electrical engineering talk about electron volts, which we can talk about the derivation, what that actually means um, when we get to when we get to quantum. Um, Therms is how they sell natural gas, oftentimes. Maybe not on your energy bill, but if you're buying natural gas as a, as a business, a lot of times it's sold as a therm, which is 100 cubic feet of natural gas. Doesn't, it's, and then really, more specifically, it's the energy that you get from burning 100 cubic feet of natural gas. Uh, so similar to BTU, it's always in terms of heat for a lot of these. Kilowatt hours. Where does that show up? Again, probably none of you are paying and the utility bills for your house yet. Um, but electricity, that's how, what shows up. If you look at your energy usage on your Liberty Utilities bill, it'll say this many kilowatt hours in the last month. Um, these last ones are more inter interesting. Barrel of oil equivalents is actually an energy unit. It's the amount of energy that you get if you burn an entire barrel of oil. Um, or if you turn a barrel of oil into gasoline and then use that gasoline to power a car, there's a certain amount of energy associated with that. So the barrel of oil equivalent is an energy unit. And then last but not least, tons of TNT is an energy unit. That's exactly what it sounds like. It's a metric ton of TNT detonated at once. That amount of energy is an energy unit. Um, what do we rate in terms of tons of TNT? Bombs. Atomic bomb, the first atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima was about 15 kilotons. In other words, it was the equivalent of detonating 15,000 tons of TNT with one device. Um, and that's metric tons, you might notice by the spelling, but it's close to imperial tons so 30,000 thousand so 30 million pounds of TNT detonated all at once um, a rather large explosion all right we're not going to do anything with TNT tons of TNT maybe I'm going to take home final maybe I'll ask a question where I have if you start from tons of TNT and turn it into something like calories um, if, you, if you detonated a 15 kiloton bomb and all of the energy went to heat up a system of water, how much, what's the temperature change of the water? We could do something like that. Because you don't know enough yet. We'll get to the point. If you keep taking chemistry classes. We'll get to the point where you're allowed to just go into the stock room and grab stuff and blow stuff up. Um, that's one of the reasons, if I'm being honest, that I was a chemistry major is my AP chem class when the AP test was done. The teacher just taught us how to use the stock room and said, everybody get good at one demonstration. And we're going to do a put on a show for the middle schoolers. And a bunch of me and my friends lit stuff on fire. Um, it was. It was a lot of fun. But you need to learn how to, how to behave in a lab first and what's safe and what's not. So you'll get there. So let's do a smaller scale example. Burning one gram of water produces 15 point or 16.5 kilojoules of energy. If all of the energy goes into 120 gram sample of water, what's the temperature change of the water? All right, so we haven't done any of these problems before yet, but what, what's your first instinct, what we're supposed to do? Write down what we're given in, and put it in terms of the right units too, right? Because that's going to help us know whether we're using the right equation. What do we know? One gram of table sugar produces 16.5 kilojoules. 16.5 kilojoules. What type of uh, value is that? Energy. So where does it go into our equation? Into our Q equals M. CP delta T, which of these variables 
is 16.5 kilojoules. Q. What else do we know? Another one of the variables is actually just not even part of the problem. It's just straight up listed at the top, right? Specific heat of water. It's 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Those units are weird, but it's, it's just like what I was talking about with the definition of a calorie, where we said one calorie is enough to change one gram of water, one degree Celsius. So if we're in calorie units, it's one calorie per gram per degree Celsius. All this is really, this unit is really saying is to raise one gram of the material by one degree Celsius. So if we know Q, we know specific heat, what else do we know? Delta T is in there. Do we know delta T? That's what we're trying to solve for. So we need to know one more variable. What other variable do we know? We know mass. Here's the trick. Is it 120 grams or is it one gram? There's two masses in that problem. I said not because 120 grams was wrong, but because I want you to think about that. What's changing temperature? The water. So which mass are we using? The water. And you can specify. A lot of times I remember feeling like putting subscripts on variables made them seem more intimidating. This is just a way to keep track of which mass we're talking about. M sub water just means the mass of the water. So we got specific heat of the water, the mass of the water. We've got the energy moving into the water. We've got Q for the water. Are we ready to just plug everything in and solve for delta T? Yeah. Close. There's one more thing that doesn't match yet, though. What are you saying, Brody? We can do the algebra and rearrange it to solve for delta T before we plug stuff in or after. Mathematically, it doesn't make a difference. But what we do want to watch out for is that our specific heat is in joules per gram degree Celsius. Delta T two separate things put together. It's it's one thing. It's change in, but change in doesn't mean anything unless you put it with another variable. So it's change in temperature, but we can solve for it like it's one variable. <laughs> We've got kilojoules here, and we have joules here. So we just want to turn kilojoules into joules. If they gave you a starting value for your temperature in this question, then you can calculate your change in temperature, add it, or subtract it from Correct. the starting value. So we could, do you go back, remind me your name again? Josiah. Josiah. Just that we could go back and treat this like it's two separate things. It does have a definition. The definition of delta anything is final minus initial. So we, we can break that apart more. And there are sometimes if we started with an initial temperature, we could sub substitute this in and then solve for final temperature. But in this, this problem doesn't give us a starting temperature, right? We don't have a starting temperature and it's asking us for the temperature change. We're just gonna look for that instead. All right, 16.5 kilojoules. How do we convert that? One kilojoule is 1000 joules. So
So this is in one of those cases where I think I, I mentioned that sometimes in engineering or sometimes um, you'll wind up with things that are look kind of like scientific notation, but they're not written exactly like scientific notation. It's just because it allows me to keep it in units of a thousand. More commonly, you write it like this, right? All right, like I was mentioning before, we can solve this for delta T first and then plug in numbers, um, or we can plug in all the numbers and then solve for delta T. It doesn't make a difference. I know um, some, sometimes physics instructors really want you to do all the algebra when it's still variables. Sometimes that's more trouble than it's worth. So I don't particularly care what order you do it in. If you have everything except for delta T, I would say just plug everything in, cancel out all your units as best you can, and, and do the algebra with numbers rather than doing the algebra with the variables. But if you wanted to solve for delta T first, we would just divide both sides by MCP, right? Just like on the review, on the math review problems. Then these cancel out, so we get delta T equals Q over CP times M. And when we plug all those numbers in, 1.65 times 10 to the four joules over 120 grams times 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Grams will cancel grams, joules will cancel joules. We're left in one over one over Celsius for our units. Does that make sense? Because yeah. what is one over one over Celsius? How do you divide fractions? What's the process if you're writing out one over one divided by one over degrees Celsius? If you're dividing fractions, what do you do? You multiply by the reciprocal, right? So one over one over Celsius is the same as Celsius, which makes sense because we're solving for a delta T. We should be getting something in temperature units. And mm, should be something like 125 over four. So something like 16. No, sorry, 25 and another six. So 31, something like 31 degrees. 32. So give me all the sig figs you've got, Brody. Okay. Exactly. How many sig figs are we going to keep here? There's three given. That there's three sig figs here, three sig figs on the energy, four on our specific heat. So we'll keep three. So 32.9 degrees Celsius. It's actually a fair bit of energy. When you think about 120 grams of water is, I don't know, roughly a coffee cup full of water. It changed 32 Celsius. That's not, that's a fairly significant temperature change. We don't need to write the plus or minus if we round it properly, because whatever the last digit we wrote is where the uncertainty is. 
right? So I want you to still thinking about the uncertainty, but you don't need to write it if you follow our rules for rounding. But that's why our rules for rounding are the way that they are, is so that you don't have to write it. All right, so we found the temperature change of the water. Where did that energy come from? The tablespoon of sugar, right? Or table sugar, not tablespoon of sugar, a gram of table sugar. What if it wasn't actually burning something? What if we just used a piece of hot metal to warm up the water? Would that change anything about our calculation here? No. No, it would be, energy would be coming from something else. It would not be coming from a chemical reaction. It would just be coming from, you put a hot piece of metal in contact with cool water. The water is going to warm up, right? And the metal is going to cool down. That's the entire basis of tomorrow's lab. You're going to heat up a bunch of met, or a sample of metal to a known temperature, basically just by just boiling it. When you boil, when you put the metal in boiling water long enough, you can assume it's the same temperature as the boiling water. Then you're going to take it and you're going to add it to a um, styrofoam coffee cup that has a measured mass of water. And you're going to watch the temperature change of the water. The cool water is going to get warm when you do that, right? And you're going to be able to use the same equation, except you're going to know delta T because you're going to measure it. So if you know delta T, we're, what we're going to be doing is know the mass of the water, know delta T of the water, and if you know specific heat of the water, because it's on the page there, it's a known, 4.184, you can get the energy that went into the water. <clears throat> Sounds easy enough, right? Where did that energy come from? Not a trick question. From, from the metal that we warmed up, right? So here's the single biggest trick is that we can do the same thing except dealing with the Q of the metal. We can say that whatever energy went into the water had to come from the metal, right? So if we can get this number, we can turn around and we can plug it in here. And if we know the mass of the metal, and we know the specific heat of, or the um, change in temperature for the metal, we're trying to solve for that number right there. Again, neither of these steps seems that tricky on its own, but when I tell you to actually go and measure this stuff yourself, it starts seeming a little bit confusing, right? Close almost equal to each other. What's the difference between it? It is one to one. One's liquid, one solid. Q for the water is not equal to Q for the metal. It's the opposite. There's a negative sign in that because the metal loses energy and the water gains it. And it makes sense when you think about it, the temperature of the water is going up, the temperature of the metal is going down. So they're the same number, but with the opposite sign. All right, let's do, let's do a practice problem. We'll get into phase change. We're not going to get to that until we find the next lecture real quick and get a good example problem here. I could try to make up numbers off the top of my head, um, but usually I'm off by too much to do that.
All right, I am going to make one up off the top of my head because I don't have a good one prepped. All right, so we'll leave this up here. Let's say we've got, let's say we've got 22 grams of metal. So your mass of the metal. Is 22.0 grams. And you heat that up so that the initial temperature of the metal is 92.5 degrees Celsius. Then you're going to take that metal and you're going to dump it into a bunch of room temperature water. Let's say that the mass of the water is, uh, let's call it 55 point, why not? 55.5 grams. Specific heat of the water is known. It's always 4.184. And that's joules per gram degree Celsius. And the initial temperature of the water is 22.0 degrees Celsius. All right, you set the table. Go ahead. So that's that specific heat term. That's the, that's how much energy does it take to change one gram of water, one degree Celsius, right? So it takes 4.184 joules of energy to change one gram of water, one degree Celsius. So we have hot metal in the test tube. We've got room temperature water. We're going to take the hot metal and dump it into the room temperature water and we're going to measure the final temperature. Let's say that the final temperature of the water is 24.5 degrees Celsius. Here's the other thing to remember is that delta T is change in temperature, right? So it's always T final minus T initial. So we have all the pieces to get Q for the water, right? Uh, yeah. Just what in, uh, in math classes, what we call a plug and chug problem. You don't even have to do any algebra because we already have, our equation already has Q solved for, right? Okay, so what's Q for the water in this case? Fifty-five point five times four point one eight four joules per gram degree Celsius. Don't forget your units. And then what's our delta T? Final minus initial, right? So it's 2.5. You could write it in there and just write it as 24.5 minus 22.0. Or you can do that math separately. So delta T for the water is equal to 2.5 degrees Celsius.
So what do we get for Q? Q for the water, 580 joules. How many sig figs do we want to keep? Three sig figs, four sig figs, two sig figs. Remember subtraction. So keep the same uncertainty, right? So we're only going to keep two sig figs. So zero point or um, 5.8 times 10 to the two joules. All right, so getting Q for the water is not too tricky, right? How do we get CP for the metal? That's our final goal for tomorrow. So Q for the metal equals mass of the metal, which we know. CP for the metal, which is what we're solving for. And delta T for the metal. We know this. We know this. Because it's just going to be negative 580, right? We need delta T. How do we get delta T for the metal? From the final temperature of the water from the initial temperature of the metal. Think there's the other key. Is that we're making the assumption that our final temperature of the water, what do we also know about the final temperature of the metal? It's going to go down from where it started, but if we waited long enough, they should be the same, right? Energy stops changing hands as, as long as everything is the same temperature, right? If, you're, if your house is the same temperature as outside, opening the windows doesn't really change the temperature of the outside or the inside, does it? So we're making the assumption that our final temperature, the metal, is also the final temperature of the water. So now we can get delta T for the metal. B68.0. It's a negative, right? Final minus initial. All right, is everybody good if I erase yeah. water over here? So, and then last, you got Q for the metal is equal to negative Q for the water. So you have negative 5.8 times 10 to the 2 joules. Now we're just plug, do another plug and chug. Now we do have to do a little bit of algebra. But we get negative 5.8 times 10 to the 2 joules equals 22.0 grams times CP, which is what we're solving for, times negative 68.0 degrees Celsius. Can we solve that? Yeah. Divide both sides by the mass, divide both sides by negative 68. We're good to go, right? So the trick with this with this lab assignment is that you're using the same equation twice, except you're doing it once for the water to get Q, and then you're doing it once for the metal to get CP. 
right? And that whole Q for the metal is equal to negative Q of the water. That's the key here. Otherwise, you wind up getting a negative specific heat when you solve for CP. And a negative specific heat doesn't make any sense. For most sub substances, that, that would be like saying when you put energy in, it got colder. There are times when that can happen, but not in a real, in a straightforward setup like this. We need something like a condenser um, or laser cooling in order for that to actually make sense in the physical world. I said laser cooling. I saw several people's eyes narrow. Laser cooling is a thing. Turns out just the same way you can use light to warm things up, if you shift the wavelength just a little bit of that light, you can cool down the same stuff. The same way that you can push somebody on a swing to make them go higher, that's basically what a laser that's warming something up is doing. It's pushing somebody on a swing with the right frequency to make them go higher and higher. But if you change the frequency of your pushes on the swing, you can actually slow them down, right? If somebody's on the swing, you stand behind them and you absorb all of their energy with your hands instead of putting energy in. All you're really doing is changing the frequency of your push, but you can slow them down. So we can actually cool things down by shining light on them, by putting energy in. But that's not what's going on in tomorrow's lab, unfortunately. That'd be a really cool lab. All right. What do we get for a number here? Point zero point three eight eight. Is it negative though? There's a negative there, and there's a negative there. So that's why that negative right here is so important. Otherwise, you get a negative specific heat. So joules, gram, degree Celsius, and actually, look at that. I did wind up making up a decent number because. There are a number of metals that have specific heats about in that ballpark. Turns out water has a really high specific heat. Almost everything else that you'll deal with in this class has a lower specific heat than water. Oftentimes by a factor of 10. All right, we have 10 minutes. Let's do a different variation of this problem. What if I tell you the specific heat of the metal and you know the specific heat of water and I ask you to predict what the final temperature will be? So let's say we're using copper. Uh, no, sorry, I don't. Do I don't remember any specific heat? We'll use that same metal. So we say specific heat of the metal. 0 0.388 and let's say we have we have twice as much metal so the mass of the metal what was it before i said 22 i think so what is it now 44 that's gram right 44 point we'll say 44.3 just to make the numbers a little bit different Joules, gram, degrees Celsius. Initial temperature of the metal. Let's say we left it in our hot water bath a little bit longer. We got it up to 94.2 degrees Celsius this time. We still have the same mass of water. And so that would make it, what did I say, 55.5? Specific heat of water is still 4.184 because it always is. And the initial temperature of the water is, let's say we cooled it back down, but we didn't wait the whole time for it to cool all the way back down. So it's 23.8 degrees Celsius. What's the final temperature going to be? This is a trickier one, huh? Because we can't solve for either of the Q values, can we? Why can't we solve for a Q? 
We don't have final temperature, we can't solve for delta T, right? Or we can't plug in a number for delta T. But we can plug this in instead of delta T. We can say Q is equal to mass times specific heat times final minus initial. We know that number, both for the metal and for the water, right? How could we, if, if we don't have enough information to get Q, how can we solve for TF? Mass times specific heat, or divide both sides by that. We could solve for TF mathematically, but if we don't have a number we can plug in for Q, that's not gonna help us yet. What do we have to do? Any guesses? Any other guesses? What else do we know about this system? We know Q for the metal is equal to negative Q of the water. So do we actually need a number for Q? No. No, we can just take this and plug it in here and take plug it in there. Right? We get a nasty looking algebra problem but still an alpha problem where we know everything except for TF. So we can say mass of the metal, specific heat of the metal, T final minus T initial of the metal is equal to what? Negative mass of the water, specific heat of the water, T final, which is the same T final as over there, minus T initial of the water. Can we solve this now? Do we know everything except for one variable? Yeah. Everything, we can plug in some everything except for TF. Like I said, it looks much more intimidating now than it did when we broke it up into two pieces, but this is basically what we just did, except we knew TF before. You could even set up the first problem we did. You could set it up the same way to solve for, for specific heat of the metal, where you would, you would just have a number to plug in. We plugged in 24.5 for TF for both of them, right? the same setup, the only difference is we can't calculate Q on its own, but if we're trying to solve for TF, we don't need to. All right, we'll leave that one there. It should be something around the 30 Celsius range. Correct, but because it's basically take multiplying this entire group by negative one, which means you only do it once, so you can put the negative wherever you want. Um, because just if you're distributing this, you don't distribute this. I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. I don't teach math, so my I don't have the right language necessarily. Um, let me think of the way that I could phrase that. Um, this is the one my false problem. Um, you're gonna have to, so there's a PDF of it on online, or you can ask Tom if he has any more comments. I don't have a copy. Yeah, I 
Digital thermometer? It took me a second. Good question. You can distribute it to both. If you put it into the probably would have the delta, then you would distribute it to both of them. I'm too tired for this. Oh, she can't. Right, but otherwise, you just have a random negative floating around, basically. Thank you. Make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I think I set them up to be in a good spot for tomorrow, and then I thoroughly confused them with the last problem. So tomorrow, they'll either be totally lost or it'll feel really easy to them. Yeah, I think, I think most of them have it. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, no matter how much practice you do for them, like once they're in the real world, they forget that they did the practice anyway. Right. So. Well, this is one where, yeah, when, when I when we set it up by explaining the physical system, seems like it goes pretty well. I think it went pretty well last, last spring. Um, I, as I recall, they didn't have too many issues with it, but yeah. And you have everything you need for that, right? You've got calorimeters and or coffee cups and. You know, yeah, it's coffee cups. I assume I didn't throw them away. I had to go look at them. There they are. Yep. Yeah, you can't really find coffee cups in, yeah. in, uh, in Tahoe anymore. They don't let you have well, and maybe they were they were forward thinking, but I think the chemistry instructor at the college before I got there yeah. um, used to just stockpile stuff when the bookstore was having a sale. So we have like forty coffee cups, or well, okay. like like plastic travel mugs. Okay. So we actually use the travel mugs, so nobody's tempted to throw them away. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Raina was making me homework due on Sunday at midnight, but you're saying... I'll, I'll change it to match what she's doing. Or, I mean, I don't mind if you can put time. What, what was... 